There are many legends in the knife industry, and for sure, one of them is Mel Pardue. Mel has been at it for over 30 years and has been involved in many aspects of knife making, particularly folding knives. I've had the privilege to be taught by Mel on several occasions, so he's sort of my go-to guy when I have a question because he knows just about everything. Mel's not really much into frame locks, but I enjoy talking to Mel anyway. I've got a question about using ball bearings in folding knives. Ball bearings have been around for a while, but they seem to be getting a lot more popular. Yet, some people still stick to using flat washers. And the washers that they use sometimes have some quite unique shapes, like this big one here that Mel used in one of his folders, and also this rather complex form that is used by Chris Reeve. These ball bearings seem to have the best fit with frame lock knives. I talked to Jake Hoback, who certainly is one of the new era knife makers, and he told me when he started out making knives, at first he tried washers, but immediately went to ball bearings and never went back. It seems like a lot of times when you pick up these knives that have ball bearings, that they open just a little bit easier. If you've got a thick frame or bolster setup where you could insert a ball bearing, it would probably be the way to go. But like anything else, there's good points and bad points. And I was kind of curious about what some other people thought. I was thinking that a push button automatic or any type of knife that had a coil torsion spring around the pivot pin already has a channel cut out for the spring. So this would exclude the possibility of using a ball bearing because that's the space taken up by the spring. It seems more and more that if knife makers aren't a machinist to begin with, they end up being a machinist by the end of experimenting with their knives. This goes along with another trend of a lot of people using CNC to make a knife, and sometimes they use CNC exclusively with very few hand operations, like in the old days. So overall, I notice another trend. There are a lot of people coming up with a new bearing design. Now, I don't know basically what all these caged ball bearings have different from one another. But I did get to talk to Al Milhouse, who has his knife company Ratworks. Despite the unusual name, Ratworks is one high-tech knife company, I could tell you. And this comes not from Al being a self-taught machinist or a machinist that decided to go into knife making. The guy's an engineer. And you can get an appreciation of how he approaches the way he makes knives. He explained to me some of the major aspects of his ball bearing design, which are quite impressive. And I could tell you, he's put a lot of thought into the design of his ball bearing. Well, whatever it's been and whatever it'll be in the future, I could tell you right now for ball bearings, it's not yet the end of the story. So I'm going to ask Mel what he thinks the trend's going to be. Well, I think I like them in certain applications, like on the automatics and some of the real tricky knives, you know, where you have a problem adjusting the tension on the blade. But in essence, I really like, I like the flat washers on a line -a lock knife. And they, they really work well there, but on automatic stuff, you always have a problem where you get the blade too tight with washers. Uh, 
the blade will freeze up and won't, won't come out of the knife properly. Certain other type knives too, but I think it's a revolution myself. I mean, it, the knives work beautifully, you know. We, you have no problem with being hard, open, and closed, and I think it's great, but I think they need to find a way to reduce the thickness of those bearings where it, you don't have to kind of bore them into the side of the blade to get them in the knife to keep them being too thick. Basically, that's it. Hey, let's talk about one of your knives. How do you, how do you like to put them together? My knives in, in particular, um, well, I, I love I love working on that. I wouldn't be here if I didn't love it, you know, but uh, I've been at it since 1957, making knives, and, and but now I see a real big trend to tactical type knives and made out of titanium and exotic materials. And we went through that 20 years ago. It seemed like it comes what what goes around comes around. I guess you know. But one of the biggest things I see is that people my age are now dinosaurs in this business. Uh, the gener the younger generation in the age of like 20 to 30 years old have literally taken over this market. You know, knife business altogether, and custom knives. I mean, it was terribly evident at the Blaze show, though. Uh, I don't know what, they're going to be coming up with some really great stuff, I guess. I mean, everybody, every time something like that happens, it changes and, and, and good things happen to, the, to our industry. So, I don't know, I was kind of shocked. I, you know, being the director, of, board of directors of the Guild, I knew almost everybody in this business for the last 20 or 30 years. and. When I walked in the, the building to come to the hotel, the Blaze Show, I walked in the lobby and it was probably a thousand people in there and I walked around in there and I knew exactly about eight people that, that was around when I joined the guild. The rest of them were all very young, new people. So that, we don't know if that's a trend or what, or we just got too old and we're the dinosaurs, you know? So, they, they, I mean, that's really kind of shocked me. I, was I asleep when it happened or what? Because I, I didn't see it coming. I don't know where it's going, but what we were doing 20 years ago, we didn't even know to call them tactical knives. They were just work knives. And those knives now with these young kids, uh, they're bringing prices that we never even thought about getting for our really fancy knives. And, my, for, for instance, my grandson had a tactical knife, just plain slab-sided tactical knife on the table here. It was a flipper, and he had had an auction, and when it sold yesterday, it was $4,900. But just kind of, I, I don't understand that, you know what I mean? I, we got, I got knives on the table here that sell for $975 that are all Damascus, carbon fiber, and all that. So uh, I, I don't know where it's going with that. You know, it just don't make any sense to me. It's something that I was doing eight or ten years ago, we got two hundred dollars for. It. So it's definitely a trend, but I don't know what kind of a trend it is. Uh, if it's just, just people want that, if you people want that, they're not interested in what we've been doing the last 20 years anymore, except for a few old leftover collectors. Man, that, that's kind of strange, really. So, I don't know. All right, I'll let you get back to the show. Okay, man. Thank you very much. Sometimes I ask tough questions. Well, you got to. That's how you learn. I didn't throw Mel a tough question, but he sure gave it a heavy answer as if it was. I think he's right. He's a bit of a dinosaur, but I would say he's a dinosaur in the same way Rembrandt and Michelangelo are. And I agree, too, that the trend is toward young guys experimenting with their CNC machine and Everything is looking very tactical. But the trend is also being picked up by the Chinese. Not only are they making illegitimate copies of people's knives, but they're also legitimately competing in the market 
for this style of knife as well. But I tell you, and I don't mean to sound smug, and I know Mel's a friend of mine, but the Chinese aren't really reproducing knives like Mel Pardue. And I'm going to leave that up to you to come up with an answer why. Well, I wrote a book on knife mechanisms, and I put a lot of mechanisms in there by Mel Pardue, because if you write a book on modern knife mechanisms, that's what belongs in there. I hope you all enjoyed a conversation with Mel Pardue. Thank you.